What would be the international implications of the U.S. expanding government's role into this area by reversing policies that have stood since the Clinton-Gore administration? Will U.S. regulation spark an international chain reaction of Internet regulation? Would the rules, as proposed, unfairly distort the market to favor one kind of market player over another, absent a showing of abuse of market power? This is just a partial list of questions that come to mind. But since we are at a lawyer's convention, and I'm running out of time, let's zero in on some of the constitutional and legal questions. Hopefully you've all had two cups of coffee already this morning. So. First of all, for you fans of legal flowcharts, it's always good to start with this one. You ready? Does the commission have the statutory authority to act as proposed? Has Congress given the commission express authority to act to regulate network management as envisioned by the proposed rules? The DC Circuit held in 2001 that administrative agencies have, quote, no constitution or common law existence or authority, but only those authorities conferred upon it by Congress, end quote. If the commission has no direct authority to regulate broadband internet service providers, its only option is to rely on its ancillary authority because the commission has determined after several market analyses that broadband is an information service that should be unregulated. In this light, we would have to note that Congress has spoken on the issue of internet regulation when it codified that the internet should be, quote, unfettered by state, by federal or state regulation, end quote. So if anything, Congress is urging regulatory restraint with that language, is it not? Additionally, the DC Circuit has told us that the exercise of ancillary authority is only appropriate when, quote, one, the commission's general jurisdiction grant under Title I covers the subject of the regulations, and two, the regulations are reasonably ancillary to the commission's effective performance of its statutorily mandated responsibilities, end quote. You know a speech with 21 footnotes is gonna be just a barn burner, don't you? <laughs> But bear with me, this is good stuff. So. Although internet services involve inter interstate and foreign communications by wire and radio and therefore fall into our general grant of jurisdiction, the next legal step we would have to take would be to establish that adoption of rules regarding internet network management was reasonably ancillary to the commission's effective performance of its statutorily mandated responsibilities. But as I have said before, I question, as a matter of law, whether Title II provisions, such as Sections 201B or 230B, provide the ancillary hook sufficient to survive appeal. For instance, Section 201 imposes obligations on common carriers. But the Commission already has determined that broadband services and the market in which they operate are different from the old common carrier market to such a degree that they should be unregulated under Title I. Although the Supreme Court said in its Brand X decision back in 2005 that the Commission could still impose some degree of regulation on internet access services even though it had classified them under Title I, the Court did not abandon its precedent on the limits of the agency's ancillary authority. Yet in crafting a proposed non-discrimination rule for the internet, the NPRM ignores the well-established limitations on our Title II authority, under which we, we may police discrimination only when it is, quote, unjust or unreasonable, end quote. Can the Commission develop regulations that are more onerous than it is authorized to impose on common carriers under the, under the specific provisions of Title II, and then foist them on currently unregulated information service providers without explicit congressional authorization to do so. In other words, can the Commission create and impose a new and stricter regulatory regime on a class of providers that has flourished in the absence of regulation without having the benefit of standing on the solid legal foundation of a new legislative mandate? Wouldn't creating such a new and untested regulatory regime without congressional authorization cause more uncertainty and not less as the item advertises. And speaking of inevitable appellate litigation, we'll see if it ends up in the Fifth Circuit, and I don't know what this means for us, but anyway, 
Uh, how many years will it take to resolve these issues? Not that the Fifth Circuit takes time to resolve issues. I don't mean to imply that, but uh, there are briefing schedules and such. Yes, you're very quick there. Whew, okay. Another question to ask is, what effect will a new regulatory framework have on the e economics of the Internet ecosystem? As the Commission prepares its national broadband pr plan, it is becoming clearer that two of its conclusions could be, number one, we want broadband adoption to increase in part through affordable pricing. And number two, the private sector will be urged to increase its investments in broadband infrastructure. Now, investors of all sizes expect a return on their expenditures. Broadband service providers pay back their investors through the earnings they receive from their paying customers, right? In light of the historical fact that Title II restrictions on common carriers' uh, discriminatory conduct are, in essence, economic regulations of rates, terms, and conditions, how would the proposed rules affect broadband service providers' freedom to be flexible in their pricing? As of today, broadband service providers can use any number of pricing methodologies to recover their costs. The most common way to charge for services is flat rate pricing, also known as all-you-can-eat. But as application providers write new bandwidth-intensive software that some consumers want, but others do not, an increasing number of diners at the flat rate buffet are eating massive amounts more bandwidth than others. As the fairness and economic realities of this natural market evolution become clearer, broadband service providers must be able to retain the freedom to be flexible and creative in their pricing. Historically, non-discriminatory pricing was all about ensuring similarly situated consumers were treated the same and were charged the same amount. It has never meant that the minority of heavy users be subsidized by all other users. Some who advocate for new rules are also arguing against pricing freedom. They should be careful what they wish for. Economic regulation of internet access could very well increase prices for consumers. Under a new non-discrimination construct, if every consumer is to be treated the same regardless of usage, then all prices, all prices must rise to compensate for the cost imposed by heavy users at times. This is especially true for shared networks such as wireless and cable, where consumers share bandwidth with their neighbors, whether they know it or not. In short, the average broadband consumer could pay a higher rate to compensate for their neighbors who consume more bandwidth. Higher broadband prices. Would that possible result of new regulation not undermine our efforts to promote affordable broadband for all Americans. With a small amount of time remaining, let me also touch, this is only an hour and a half, right? I get uh, 89 minutes of that? No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> 18 through 21. Oh, darn. Well, that ought to reduce things. No, seriously, this, the rest of it will move quickly. But with a small amount of time remaining, let me also touch on a couple other issues that have, uh, haven't been discussed much yet. And one can't speak at a Federalist Society event without mentioning the Constitution. Come on, I heard some whispers. Okay, I'll start with the First Amendment because it's first. That's right. Okay. Very good. Were you, a, okay. were you a law professor in a different law? No, no, no. <laughs> Although the standard of review may be lower than with individuals, corporations still have protected rights to speak under the First Amendment. Additionally, the commission bears the commission bears the burden of justifying any speech regulation it imposes on corporate entities, just as it does with individual citizens. In fact, the Supreme Court has held, quote, speech does not lose its protection because of the corporate identity of the speaker, end quote. The level of constitutional scrutiny applicable to a net neutrality non-discrimination mandate is a key question to be resolved. One could easily argue that strict scrutiny, the most exacting standard, should apply because the rule regulates speech exchanged on a privately managed broadband network. In the context specifically of FCC actions, the court's view has been that, quote, precedents apply the most exacting scrutiny to regulations that suppress, disadvantage, or impose differential burdens upon speech because of its content, end quote. Yet even if the government could prevail upon a court to apply only the lesser intermediate scrutiny standard, the commission still would have to prove that its burden on speech furthers an important state interest and is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Even that test requires that the commission first demonstrate, with empirical evidence, the existence of an actual problem. 
and then show that the challenge speech regulation actually addresses it. 